couple of concordances. So everybody's got Roger Williams. Everybody's got the uh, Portsmouth Compact. The other one's in the back. Oh, and the other one's in the back, back there. Okay. The reason I chose these four names, this is nothing original with me, but uh, I'm building on great work that other people have done. For instance, Robert Torbett, who is a Baptist historian, he wrote, it was made crystal clear in the American colonies in the teachings of Dr. John Clark, Roger Williams, Isaac Backus, and John Leland. The story of their persecution is so well known that a bare mention of it here suffices to recall to us today the everlasting debt we owe to them and to others who with them courageously denied the right of a civil magistrate to interfere in the matters of conscience and religion. Democratic America should be eternally grateful to the Baptists of colonial New England and Virginia for it was in part at least their struggle for religious liberty which culminated victoriously in the omission of any religious tests or restrictions when the Constitution of the United States was being framed. That's talking about Article 6 of the United States Constitution. Then Alan Phelps Stokes, who's an Episcopalian, wrote a three-volume work called Church and State in the United States. Go to a library and page through those volumes. If nothing else, just look at the plates and read the captions you will know more about the religious history of America than most Supreme Court justices. Just to do that. Okay. The Baptist groups mentioned were the forerunners and forebearers of those Baptists who were the most outspoken opponents of church-state idea in America and who contributed powerfully to the cause of religious toleration and freedom through such prophets of a better day as Roger Williams, John Clark, Isaac Backus and John Leland, whose specific services to the cause will be considered later. So, what I'm doing here, after Pastor asked me to do this, this is what needs to be done. We need to perpetuate the foundation that these four men left. And so, by the way, I still have some copies from these others. If any of you did not attend the other sessions and you would like to have those, I'd be glad to share uh, anything I have with you. And the other thing is, is that uh, at the end of all of these, I think I have uh, given you my email address. And the Adobe copy on your computer will look better than these sheets that I printed in grayscale, okay, because they're all in, the pictures are all in color and so forth. So, uh, we go to Roger Williams. And the first thing that uh, I want to mention about uh, Roger Williams uh, in the account that I give here uh, let's see uh, yeah it would be at uh, 1636 is what I'm talking about I want to start right here because uh, again as I was th this is the most re recent book by the way I've been living with Roger Williams a long time in my life this was my history project for my high school American or U.S. history class in 1963. Roger Williams' relationship to the founding and opening of Rhode Island as a free port of entry to all people, even the Jews. Okay, so I've been living with this all this time, and uh, so this this is the mo most recent book I bought. And this man's um, he is like a. Uh, a um, a reporter, you know, writes for magazines and all kinds of things. But this is a tremendous study. And the one thing that particularly struck me again as I, re I read this, is, see, I was coming home from a, yeah, I was coming home from an NRBFC conference in, uh, in uh, 2017, and I ran into this at the um, Old Sturbridge Village in their store. They had them on sale out there. And I said, do I need another book on Roger Williams? I said, Oh, I'm going to buy it and see. He, he's a wonderful writer, very engaging, and he is thorough. He's got all kind of documentation, and uh, he lays before you things in a dramatic way that particularly struck me. But Williams was opposed here in America. Uh, 
he had problems with the church in Boston. He went out to Salem, and they liked him there, but the Boston people didn't like what he was doing in Salem. Then he went down to Plymouth and uh, was doing well with the people at Plymouth down there and his teaching. They liked him as a teacher. He had a wonderful personality, apparently. Even his enemies later, they corresponded with him and, and so forth. And uh, he, he was he was so uh, solid in his convictions and wouldn't move that it caused all kind of problems. And yet he was such a nice guy. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing thing. But at any rate, uh, the people in Boston, the leadership, especially the clergy of the established church, the Puritans, they came over here for freedom. And then they ended up acting worse than the people back then. They wanted their freedom, but they wouldn't let anybody else have freedom. That was their problem, okay? And so they were actually going to put him on a ship and send him back to England against his will because they were fed up with him and didn't want him interfering with what they were going to do. And... In England, who knows what would have happened to Williams. He was not going to be well received at this point uh, under the monarchy still. I mean, preachers, good preachers were coming to America because they didn't want to be under the Bishop Laud and all those over there. So, I think, the more I read this and think about it, that the governor at that time was Sir Henry Vane. And... Henry Vane later left New England and went back to England and became part of the Parliament after they got rid of the King and Oliver Cromwell, they set up the government and so forth. He was like the Speaker of the House over there. And when Williams went over there for various things, he was entertained at the estate of Sir Henry Vane. And so I think the reason Williams got tipped off, even though he was sick and it was dead winter, that he better get out of town, was because Henry Vane tipped him off. And so he went down to the Indians that he'd already been making contact with. He'd already been learning their language and so forth. And he no more than got settled down there that he got a letter from Sir Henry Vane and said, we've got word that the Pickwits over in... Uh, in the Native Americans in Connecticut are going to have a war council with the uh, Narragansetts. And they're going to get all the Indian troops together and they're going to wipe the English off of the face of the earth in New England. And at that point, if they'd have done that, they could have done it. They could have went right along the coast, burnt villages, killed people, and eradicated the colonies. They had enough Indians, they could have overpowered the English. Well, there was one man in America that could do something about it, and his name was Roger Williams. He was the only person that could go to their war council and sit in the war council and actually know what was going on. He didn't have to have an interpreter at this point. And so, he had some friends that he had made of the chiefs of the Narragansetts, and they got along wonderfully well. And in fact, when the older one died, Williams actually took care of his funeral. He ran a trading post, and the Indians wanted to bury him with the very nicest brocade and all this stuff, you know. And Williams gave them what they needed for the chief's burial, that, but that was later. But at this time, he went at the invitation then of these two chiefs and uh, accompanied them. And there were all these thousand or more Indians in a war council. And he's the only white man there. And, uh, uh, and so uh, he uh, sits in on this and uh, all these negotiations and uh, he was uh, actually he wrote later I think probably to one of the Winthrop's or something and told them that he couldn't sleep at night 
because he was so fearful that he he trusted these Narragansetts that he was with, but he was so fearful that the Pequots would come and slit his throat in the night. He just, it, it was terror, but he was the only person, and so he was able, he listened to all this, and he tried to answer all their arguments and tell them that there were they had legitimate complaints about what the colonies were doing and that he would go to these different ones or write to them and he would see what he could do to straighten out these things and so forth. He was able to persuade the chief of the Narragansetts that they did not go in with the, the Pickwits. And so Roger Williams saved the New England colonies at that point. He was the only man that could do could could do that. Uh, it's a very significant thing, and probably not that well recognized today. Now, in many other ways, Roger Williams is a most notable figure in history, and I've illustrated that somewhat by putting you some of the monuments up here. He is the only American who has a statue in the Reformation. Memorial in Geneva, Switzerland, okay, along with Calvin and Bizet and all of these <coughs> others. Here's an American, Roger Williams, <laughs> that his ideas, his thinking furthered the Reformation. He carried the Reformation ideas further than even what those did. He was more advanced than they. And so, uh, in Statuary Hall, in the uh, White House, every state has two statues. One of Rhode Island's is Roger Williams. So if you're ever there, look for Roger Williams. Then there's this big memorial that's part of the National Park in Providence, Rhode Island. And you can go online and, re and, and by the way, that um, website for Roger Williams has a lot of good information. They tell that they have a lot of illustrations and so forth. That's good. Then there's also another monument to him up on uh, Terrace Park that I have mentioned there. Then uh, in uh, also in Providence, I give the streets here, there is a monument of where he actually landed when he finally settled uh, there going back to 1636. And then there is this Smith's Castle. The uh, Indian name is uh, Kokumkuskuk. Uh, and that is where, uh, that is below um, and down some creek estuary and out to the Narragansett Bay. And it was a, a logical place with the Indian uh, traffic and so forth and other trade traffic to get to Providence. So he set up this trading post, which of course was a very good location. And again, he worked this all out with the Indians. And this was one of the things the others didn't like about him is because he told them, he said, you have these uh, papers from England that gave you this land. That's all good between the Europeans. That the, the, Some Europeans claim this, some Europeans claim that. But what about the rights of the Indians? He believed in the rights of the Indians. They were already here and that when we came we should negotiate with them and treat them like human beings that have rights. That's, that was his attitude. And so he bargained about these properties that he had. He bargained with uh, about establishing Providence. And the amazing thing is he could have been the richest man in Rhode Island at that time because he could have held on to the property and sold it off himself as a land speculator. But he did not do that. He was interested in the welfare of building a city there. He gave the land to the city. And as they sold off lots, then that gave income to the city to operate the civil function of society. This is the way, uh, I mean, he's just, just a magnanimous person in, in such regard. So, uh, that, and that, uh, there's an interesting story about that that's in a book called uh, Plantation in Yankee Land. And this man, uh, the man that wrote it was a former president of the University of Rhode Island, does a great deal of research, and he goes into what happened to this property. And by the way, this property is still a, uh, it's a privately owned uh, historic site. And people can go there and have their weddings and stuff like that, but there's, uh, you know, 
beautiful gardens and things where people can walk for free and uh, so on. This house that's pictured here is not the actual house that was there. The man, uh, he, he sold this property eventually to a man by the name of Richard Smith. That's why it's called Smith's Castle. And he built, built a wonderful home, but because of Indian problems and stuff at that time, it had a stockade all around it. So this was the place that people could go for safety if there, were, if there was trouble. And, but eventually, late near the end of William's life, there was what was called King Philip's War, which Roger Williams was unable to prevent. And this property was burnt down at that, that other property too. Providence was burnt down as well uh, but uh, at that time. But uh, he couldn't do anything about it. So this is not the original house, but there is a memorial there, I believe, uh, in one of the books, well, in, that, in this very book, it shows a memorial of the site where they believe his trading post was located. So that was a, uh, a significant thing. And in all of this, Roger Williams was just an industrious person. He must have been very, very healthy. And um, he always had a garden. He planted things. And he was sort of like Thomas Jefferson, that people were writing to him about what kind of grains to grow and... Uh, which livestock would you know do well and and all and of course he had a lot of this information because of working with traders he had, as a young person he he had worked uh, in some of the some of this kind of commercialism uh, for other people and so forth as a young person so he had actually learned the Dutch language clear back over in uh, in England and so the, the the Dutch that did a lot of the training out of uh, New York City and so forth uh, he knew their language, and so he knew all about seeds and bulbs and, you know, animals and all the things that were being developed in Europe and things that could be brought to America and tried and so forth. And so all his life, he was always having a garden, uh, and, and, these, and, and when he had this trader's place out there, he had animals out on island, an island that he purchased from the Indians and, uh, and, you know, growing crops along the ocean and the marshlands and, you know, all these kinds of kinds of things so he was experienced in all that type of thing now uh, so uh, oh he grew up of course in a section of London that's called Smithfield and that's near the Newgate prison and uh, this is where they used to burn people at the stake okay and this is a monument that's down here above Mystic, Connecticut, uh, a little place called Uncasville on Route 32. And if, as you drive by, there's a little mini mall here and there's a cemetery up on the hill. If you look up there, you'll see a big obelisk. Well, that obelisk is to the Whiteman family. And uh, it lists the first, uh, the first one here is John. This is back over in England that was burned at the stake uh, let's see, just a second, where am I wrong about that? Where do I want to go to? Oh no, Edward, I'm sorry, I said John here, but it's Edward, burned at the stake in eight, 1612. And uh, the people who were working on the King James Version of 1611, two of those men on that committee authorized the burning of this man, okay? They were dignitaries in the church and so right. Why did they do that? Because they were nonconformists. They didn't conform church to the Anglican Church and the way that the worship was. Okay, and that's the foundation for the Puritans that came to America, and for the Baptists that grew up and and uh, printed their first London Confession in 16, 16, uh, 1644 and so forth. They all came out of this movement of people who read the Bible, read that you must be born again and that the normal hermeneutic of reading the Bible governs the way that the church operates and the state operates as well. And so uh, when we don't know exactly when he was born. He was born around 1600, uh, 1603 something, uh, Roger Williams I'm talking about. And so he was a child or a young person these were the last people to be burnt. Now, they beheaded other people later, and they hung other people later, but it was the last burning of the state was actually done in his neighborhood where he grew up. And 
because of that then he was the Lord led he gravitated to these nonconformists and that's where he was uh, uh, converted and uh, so then he went to school and one of the things there was the development of shorthand at that time and he became proficient in shorthand he was a master of language to start with okay the fact that he could pick up the Indians language and he was the person that uh, on one of his, I think it was his first trip back to England, he uh, caused a sensation over there that he printed uh, uh, his book, The Key to the Languages of America, okay, when he was back over in England. That his, I think all of his books were printed in England. And uh, so uh, uh, that's a, a reprint of some of the things that, that, that uh, some historical society or something up there uh, has done. But uh, what I was saying that he learned shorthand and because he was so proficient and intelligent at this, he came to the attention of a man by the name of Sir Edward Coke. And so at 13 years of age, he became his secretary. And so he is going to all the important meetings in Parliament and the King's Court and everything. He's mixing with everybody, that's anybody, uh, as a 13-year-old boy, just observing, picking everything up. And uh, eventually, that man sent him to school at Cambridge, and he graduated, and uh, he was proficient in Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and uh, then he was a uh, private uh, clergy, you might say, at a, at a big estate, okay? They had a chapel there, and uh, he tutored the children and all that type of thing uh, in his early, early days, but... Uh, Eventually, the uh, the uh, climate in uh, uh, England, he, he saw the writing on the wall, and uh, I'll mention there that uh, uh, they were having all these troubles. He got married. It tells him, I, I tell here about his marriage uh, after the section of 1623 there, and of the Marsham family, that's that family he lived with, or M Massam, excuse me, Massam. Uh, and then, uh, but uh, notice down 1629, Parliament adjourned in conflict with Charles I. Then meetings of the Massachusetts Bay Company, three ministers attended. Thomas Hooker, who started Connecticut, John Cotton of Boston fame, and Roger Williams. And so then he immigrated to America on the ship Lion in uh, 1630. And then he had all these uh, uh, problems there in the Boston. They, they were not a separatist church, so he wouldn't join that. He went out to Salem, as I told you, and uh, the people in Boston interfered with that. So uh, 1631, departure to Plymouth Plantation began interacting with Native Americans, notable for recognizing their human rights. Act 1626, the, the blood of all nations, you know, they, you know, we're all from Adam, you know regardless of skin color or where you are and so forth and uh, royal patents related to Europeans Williams advocated in negotiating with Native Americans for land use 1633 to miss from Plymouth returned to Salem and uh, uh, Williams was a pastor there for a while and he was farming and traveled by canoe learning from the Indians mastering their language uh, and Williams' friendship with the new governor, Henry Vane, another friend, John Winthrop Jr., uh, was back in New England, and Williams loses support of the Salem Church, and he's banished by the Plymouth Bay Colony, and he's sick. And he, he goes out in the night, and the Indians help him, and he establishes uh, uh, Providence, and they founded the First Baptist Church in 1639. He purchased this Kokumkusuk, for the trading post and home that have been became Smith's Castle later. 1643, Williams returns to England to seek recognition of the colony, his first trip. Travel by way of New Amsterdam. Indian War on Dutch. Williams negotiates peace. On board ship, Williams writes a key to the language of America that I just showed you. Uh, United Colonies formed for military protection. That's uh, the it was Bay State, uh, and uh, 
Connecticut, and so forth, linked up together. Williams arrives in London early June 12th, convening of the Westminster, so the king is gone now, and uh, the convening of the Westminster Assembly of Divines, key published in September, and one of these Indian chiefs that was important was killed by Uncas and a group of the Mohegans, uh, which was bad for the, the colonies, actually, because this king that was killed was somebody that Williams could negotiate with and keep peace. This other people, <laughs> this, was, this was the beginning of, of serious problems. Um, at any rate, Williams publishes Mr. Cotton's uh, letter examined and answered, attending Parliament, a lobbying committee on foreign plantations, um, granted charter for Providence plantations in Narragansett Bay with the help of Sir Henry Vane. So this was the first charter then that they had for the, the colony and it just concerned what would be Providence and Warwick at that point. Um, and uh, uh, I give some references here of um, of uh, the things that he was publishing about religious liberty and so forth, but especially the bloody tenet of persecution for cause of conscience discussed in a conference between truth and peace. And this is the foundation of his whole understandings of religious liberty, of, of what he had argued with John Cotton and these ministers in Boston that had caused him uh, all these uh, trouble. So that was pr printed in, in England. And so these concepts are entering into the mind of the people of England. And particularly then when you come down to the founding of this country, these ideas from Williams, which are quite verbose, okay, and you, you know, you re he says things, takes a lot of words to say things. That was all honed down by a name, by the man by the name of John Locke. And John Locke then wrote essays on government that influenced Thomas Jefferson and the other foundries of this nation. But the basis of part of those arguments that Locke made was from Roger Williams. However, Roger Williams' concept of liberty of conscience was higher than Locke. Locke would not have agreed to allow Roman Catholics <laughs> To have liberty of conscience, you see. Not Roger Williams. Roger Williams said, if you live peaceably with us by the laws that we establish in our civil compact of people living together, it doesn't matter to me whether you are a Mohammedan, a Catholic, a Quaker, a Jew, whatever, that if you'll live peaceably, we can have a civil society. We have to grant each other the rights to have our own conscience and our own religion. We don't have to agree with you, but if we'll live peaceably, this is the only way that society will work. And that has served us well for a couple of hundred years. And we still enjoy it today and pray that we can help keep it. But uh, there is in all this, you see, that we cannot be unconcerned about the society around us. We certainly have to pray, and we need to be informed, and we need to elect people we agree with, like these old Baptists I talked about. They elected James Madison and Thomas Jefferson because those people were friends of the cause of Baptists. I'm not saying they're in heaven. I don't know. That's up to them and God. But they elected those men to preserve liberty and, and to establish liberty. And so... Uh, at any rate, uh, so uh, in 1646, uh, this other man that I've given you, uh, um, what's his name, <laughs> Dr. John Clark, he had come down uh, as well and established, with the help of Williams, okay, he and some other separatists, they came down and they established Rhode Island, okay, which is the island in Narragansett Bay, the northern part is called Portsmouth, the southern part is called uh, uh, Newport. And uh, Williams helped them, they came to him and he helped them negotiate for this, this property and that became Rhode Island. 
Now, Clark then and Williams developed a relationship to work together. They were striving for the same goals, and they had much the same theological beliefs and so forth. And, um, and uh, they decided then and led Rhode Island of Portsmouth and Newport and Providence and uh, uh, Warwick that they became Providence Planta uh, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations and they, the, the new folks accepted the charter of Williams and that they would have one government was to their benefit to have uh, one government and then uh, when, and I, I put out that Portsmouth Compact for you which is a most interesting uh, document and, and uh, this this actually is on a monument that you can find there on the island of Rhode Island okay and I give the directions about it here uh, but at any rate it's and there's you can go there and see it in fact and, uh, I think I, on the yeah the Clark paper uh, I have a little little picture there of where it's a stone in the ground and uh, and the uh, on it are these words which they, this was this is not a church covenant this was the organization of the body politic this is the civil government and this is the basic organization we whose names are underwritten do hereby solemnly in the presence of Jehovah incorporate ourselves into a body politic and as he shall help will submit our persons lives and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and to all those perfect and absolute laws of his given in his holy word of truth to be guided and judged thereby. This was a Christian state, okay? Rhode Island was established as a Christian state. Mm -hmm. And the people that are named here, I mentioned down here, note three who signed were members of Anne Hutchinson's family. She was in this group. Uh, they, again, the clergy had given her a lot of trouble. And uh, three of her family, her husband and two sons, are here in this group. She was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and excommunicated from the First Church of Boston because she emphasized grace over law. Then also William Dyer is mentioned here and Dyer was the husband of Mary Dyer, the Quaker, hanged by the Puritans on the Boston Common for her pernicious and dangerous doctrine. Now this actually happened a number of years later that uh, William Dyer, Clark, and Williams had to make a, another journey to England because uh, a man by the name of William, who's on here by the way, William Coddington, who had been a leader in Boston and uh, was an important person, uh, but he went back to England and he had the, uh, the, the uh, Commonwealth over there name him as the uh, governor for life, <laughs> which took away uh, the rights really of, of the people there and so this alarmed Clark and Williams and they went back to England to get this straightened out and and uh, John Clark persevered for here. his wife and daughter had died over here so he had no family over here. he went back over there and he could employ himself both as a medical doctor and and a preacher and he stayed over there for I believe it was 12 years and he was there till Oliver Cromwell was removed and uh, people like Henry Vane and a number of other people that Williams knew very well, they were all beheaded. And, uh, and I think their heads were put on posts or something like at the Tower of London or something like that uh, because it was, you know, it was a kangaroo court type of thing and they were all treated as the fact that they had uh, be or they had uh, killed the first the Charles the first okay but they had they had just been the government that took over later but at any rate the monarch Charles the second was so angry with them that these ones got uh, beheaded and uh, uh, one of them that had been in the government you may not realize this is a Baptist by the name of John Milton. We know him as a poet, but he was actually the Secretary of State, so he'd been very involved in the government, 
but that they were gracious and pardoned him. He, he did not get his head cut off. Uh, but he was a good friend of Roger Williams, and when he lived, when Roger Williams lived at Sir Henry Vane's house, uh, John Milton was the Secretary of State, and uh, he had to deal with the Dutch, and so Roger Williams taught him Dutch while he was over there on this period of trying to get things straightened out about William Coddington, and then they got that straightened out, and so the old charter was in force again. He came, uh, Williams then came home, uh, William Dyer and his wife came home, but William Dyer, uh, Dyer and his wife made the mistake of staying in Boston, and Boston once kicked her out and, and said, you know, don't come back, and uh, uh, they hung some other people, didn't have, she wouldn't listen, and she kept going back, and so they, that's where she finally got hung, but that was after she had traveled with Williams and Clark over there to England and back, and of course, Williams hears about this in Providence, he is not happy about this at all, and he later, you know, he kept his correspondence up with uh, uh, Governor Winthrop and different ones there, and he told him later, he said, uh, he said, when you stand before God, he says, I, I'm glad I don't have to answer for what you have to answer for, you know, uh, because he, he was upset with this because Williams believed that the only weapon that the church could use was the sword of the Spirit. And we have no right to go to the government and ask somebody to be chased out of our town or uh, be banished, put them in jail, fine them, whatever, because we don't like what they believe. And of course, we don't want anybody to do that to us either, you see. But um, and I, I wanted to point out here, as I put on this sheet, um, on the back there, uh, when Clark was arguing, and see, he stayed around long enough that then the, mon uh, the monarchy had been restored. And this is, I, I can't imagine how he worked this out. He made this petition. In his petition, he said, uh, they have freely declared that it is much on their hearts if they may be permitted to hold forth a lively experiment that a most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained and that among our English subjects with a full liberty in religious concernments and that true piety rightly grounded upon gospel principles will give the best and greatest security to sovereignty and will lay in the hearts of men the strongest obligations to true loyalty. In other words, be believers that are obeying the word are going to make good citizens, is what he's saying. But the little words there that he said grounded upon gospel principles. You see, he's talking about the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Again, normal hermeneutics, the interpretation of the Bible. We believe all the Bible, but we live and operate on the New Testament principles, you see. And there's no, nothing in the New Testament that says we can combine our power with the state to get our will, mm -hmm. you see. And that's based on that. All of these other people, their problem was they believed the church had taken the place of Israel. And therefore, they were like the Old Testament prophets. And they, the Old Testament people, they stoned people. They did all these things. That's what they were supposed to do. That's literal interpretation for what Israel was supposed to do back then. But that doesn't carry over into the New Testament. We are not the church. Excuse me, we are not Israel, I want to say. We are not Israel. And so... Uh, that's the that's that's the point in there. We are told uh, the New Testament teaches a gracious invitation to the gospel, 2 Corinthians 5. There's no coercion upon anyone's conscience. There is no civil banishment, punishment, or death sentence for heresy or apostasy. Christians are taught, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, Romans 12, 18. Rhode Island and Providence plantations became an example to the world for freedom of conscience with Baptists, other denominations, Quakers, and Jews living in peace. And uh, Daniel Eddy said, and from this day, that day to this, the Baptists have been in this country the uncompromising opponents of coercion of conscience, state religions, and usurpation of spiritual power by civil magistrates 
as ages before they were in Europe. That's why we left Europe, okay, but we weren't going to bring those problems here. The Baptists, people like Roger Williams, laid the foundation for a new kind of uh, society. And so that uh, 16, back to the, the Roger Williams uh, um, outline there, 1661 is that return trip to, uh, to England, and then uh, 1664 he had come back, and then 1657, oh, oh by the way there, he writes an important uh, uh, letter uh, that starts out, there goes many a ship to sea, and he, I, I didn't copy that for it, but that can be found, you can go online, I'm sure, and put Roger Williams, and uh, there goeth the ship to sea, and you find it, but he uses the idea of there being a master of a ship, and the crew, and the passengers, and he uses that as an analogy of how civil society works uh, together, and uh, again, that, that, that uh, philosophy's had a great impact. Um, and so uh, he left public life in basically in 1657, uh, but he was uh, always an apostle for freedom in an ordered civil society. He was the enemy of anarchy. And uh, so uh, Clark then in 1663 got this extraordinary charter and he came back and another interesting thing of Williams, now, as I said, Williams was for the, the uh, uh, freedom of the Quakers, but he did not agree with the Quakers. And so you'll notice there in 1672, he's age 69 approximately, he challenged the Quakers uh, to a debate in Newport, and he was over at the Providence, and... Uh, he got in a canoe and paddled 20 miles. Have you ever seen the big bridge that goes across the Narragansett Bay? Okay. This guy went to Newport in a canoe at 69 years of age and so forth. Just a tremendous effort. And he, uh, he debated them and out of that uh, came his book called George Fox Digged Out of His Burroughs. And uh, again, Williams continued preaching regularly all his life. He made monthly visits to Smith's Castle where many would gather to hear him. He influenced the founding of the Sixth Principal Baptist Church in North Kingston as early as 1665 and a Baptist meeting house on Stony Lane about two miles west of Smith's College. And that again, information comes out of this book uh, about... Uh, Smith's Cottage, or Smith's Castle, I want to say. Um, and uh, in 1880, oh, see, excuse me, I got to get to uh, 1775, 1776, King Philip's War, in which Williams was unable to prevent the burning of Smith's Castle, the burning of Providence, including Roger Williams' own home. And in his last years, he endured poverty and deteriorating health. In his last surviving letter, he concludes, The all-seeing eye has seen it, and his all-powerful hand hath helped me. Blessed be his holy name to eternity. I mean, this man continued this uh, uh, godly, spiritual life. And I might just mention that when the Indians were done burning Providence, they were on the outskirts of the city, and somehow they sent a message back that they wanted to talk to Roger Williams. And alone and unarmed, the people who had already just been destroyed, he went out and talked to them, okay? And, you know, basically he said, why have you done this to us, you know? What have I done to you, you know? And all we've tried to negotiate and do everything, and they wouldn't hear him and so forth. And he warned him, he said, just like the Pickwits earlier that I talked about, those people got wiped off the face of the earth eventually because that other Indian... Uh, um, uh, tie together a treaty did not work out because of William's influence eventually then the United Colonies got together and there was a massacre and uh, the, where a whole bunch of their braves were they, they actually there was some German uh, uh, mercenaries that were involved and so forth and they burnt down the Indians and anybody that tried to escape they killed them and the, the Pequot tribe went out of existence and the few stragglers that were left 
joined other tribes. That's, that's the end of them. And Williams told these ones there, he said, you keep this up, this is going to be the end of you. Okay? And so eventually King Philip and all of them uh, were killed. And, and a lot of that is not really nice stuff. It wasn't all done the way Roger Williams would have done it and so forth. But he warned them of, uh, that they were going to bring terrible things upon their head. And, uh, and they departed, and he was uh, not able, to, but they, they spared him and so forth, but that they wanted to talk to him. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So uh, uh, I, in these notes that I've made here, I want you to point out, not only did he believe in religious freedom, but he also believed in the consent of the governed that ends up in the Declaration of Independence, that the authority for government is in the people and the, the powers of the government are derived from the people and our constitution is so written that the government is only supposed to do the powers that we've given to them and there's a big problem with that in our society article one enumerates what congress is supposed to do and congress has basically blown that off and said we'll do whatever we want to do and uh, there needs to be a movement in America to take back the country for the people. And that's why we're $30 trillion in debt and so forth, because that is not being complied with. But this idea that the power is not the divine right of kings, but it, the power lies in the people. This was in Williams, and this Henry Vane preached this over in, uh, in the parliament and so forth. And that was part of the reason why he lost his head because he made that stand. So uh, on the paper on John Clark there, just notice there is a, uh, uh, you can look up on the website, you can see this picture and more information about John Clark and the, the, um, um, the um, historical society they have there in Port Portsmouth and then where he's buried, there is a little cemetery that it was the orchard of his property. Uh, it's not down in the main part of Newport. You have to go up, uh, uh, I think it's Broadway, um, um, where that is. Uh, I think it's here. Yeah, Broadway and Calendar, Calendar Avenue. And Calendar is named for another important Baptist that was a later pastor of the Newport Church. And then the church that that they established in Newport is still continuing, and, but I think it has liberal affiliations, but nonetheless there is a building on, uh, it's not the building that they built in Clark's day, but it's an old building that uh, is on Spring Street. Actually, that's I can tell you, that's 30 Spring Street. I didn't put that on here, but 30 Spring Street uh, there. But uh, he was over there many years, as I've already described, but he did come back to America eventually, and was involved in the government of uh, Rhode Island and um, um, even after he left the government they often were calling on him because he was this uh, had this legal mind and, and could sort things out. Let me give you just a little summary about John Clark. Uh, it would be interesting to compare him with his illustrious contemporary and fellow laborer Roger Williams. Any attempt so to write history as to ignore either of these men is a perversion of history. Any attempt to represent them as inimical to each other or even as rivals is dishonoring to both. They were both noble men and wrought nobly and well for their generation and for future ages. They were friends and allies, not rivals, although very unlike in many particulars. Williams was perhaps the more speculative. Clark was the more practical. Williams was perhaps the more impulsive, Clark the more calm and judicious, Williams was the more voluminous writer, Clark the more skillful statesman and diplomat. Both were zealous champions of soul liberty, both earnestly toiled for the realization of a great principle, both wrought persistently and successfully for the enfranchisement of the mind. Both deserved to be enrolled among the benefactors of the world. And so we'll have to conclude with that. So again, the colonial period, Roger Williams and John Clark. And again, Roger Williams, though he did not stay with the church, 
he still kept preaching all of his life and I don't know why he couldn't work it out to be part of a church and build churches but nonetheless his preaching the gospel led to people joining churches and, and forming churches so there was just some hang up that he had there that it was all about thinking that you had to be baptized by somebody that was baptized by going back to the apostles or something and we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that is all blown away. Paul says it doesn't matter who baptized you. You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ and uh, then you have to be baptized by the right mode. Those are the two questions and so if you're being baptized as a testimony of Jesus Christ on the authority of the Word of God that you're baptized by the commandment of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost it doesn't matter if you know any other believers. If you have a Bible and you start following it, this is what John Clark believed, you know. If you have a Bible and follow it, you don't have to have some lineage in the background because your authority comes from God and Jesus Christ is the head of your church, you see. And uh, so I don't, I don't know why Williams couldn't get this reconciled, but uh, he was a stubborn guy. <laughs> Likeable, great friend. He would do anything even for people that were his enemies. It's amazing. He had left a great example in that. So we have to leave it there. Let's go on to our next session. Thank you all for coming.